I'm not going to be here this Friday. So, no class on Friday. I would like to do the quiz um, next week, but um, maybe you know on Tuesday of next week we're doing a Monday schedule. So, we have no class on Tuesday, which means our next class, I mean, we will have class as usual tomorrow, but then the next class we'll have after that will be Wednesday of next week. So, um, no class Friday. You don't look too disappointed about that. I'm sorry if any of you are. Um, and the quiz number four on Wednesday, the 23rd. Yeah. That's Wednesday of next week. And I don't know if you remember this. Our first test is on Friday of that week. So exam number one on Friday, the uh, 25th. All right, so these are all things to look forward to. Uh, we will have a homework assignment as usual due on this, uh, on this day. Homework number uh, five, I guess. But um, that quiz will not cover the same material, right? The quiz on that day will be from the homework that is due tomorrow. All right, I hope that's clear. Any questions about any of that? Yes? Yeah, the exam takes up the whole class period. So on this day, this Wednesday, we'll do the quiz, and then the rest of that day, we'll just talk about review for the test. The test covers everything that we've done so far. And, uh, well, I'll say more about it then. But you should expect the format of the test to be similar to the quizzes, although I'm actually going to, like, print it out and hand it out to everybody. But, you know, I write the questions, you write the answers. Any other questions about that? All right, great. I missed the big announcements. Still figure it out. Um, let's talk about the Bonsaf. That's what we were doing last time. The Bonsaf Power Index. We did one example. I want to refresh our memory about it, and then we will do some more examples today. Um, so the one example that we did was like this. I have a weighted voting system. The quota is 16, and then I got 12, 10, and 5 for my weights. As usual, I'm going to call these weighted voters A, B, and C. And then the way you do the Bonsoff is, first of all, you list out all the combinations of voters which actually can add up to the quota. These are just groupings of the voters, not considered in order, but you could take all of them, which is A, B, and C. Or you could take only two of them in several different ways. You could take A and B, or A and C, or B and C. Or you could take only one of them in three different ways. You could take just A, just B, just C. Or you could take nobody, which I'm going to write like that with a little sort of a zero with a slash through. It means nobody. Those are all the possible ways that you could choose some combination of the voters. Uh, and really, we only want to consider the combinations where they actually do add up to the quota. So I'm going to, in each case, add up the total of that combination. So if it's A and B and C altogether, that adds up to 12 plus 10 plus 5 is 27. And that does make the quota, right? The quota is 16 in this case. Um, a and B, just A and B, adds up to 22. A and C adds up to 17. B and C adds up to 15. I'm just adding up the total of those uh, voters in each combination. A by itself is 12. B by itself is 10. C by itself is 5. And nobody adds up to 0. All right? And like I said, we only need to consider those which actually do add up to the quota of 16. And so actually, I don't need to consider any of these. You consider only those which add up, which uh, meet the quota. All right. And then I am going to, in each row which actually meets the quota, we determine which ones are the critical voters. And in each of these rows, one or more of them could be critical. Sometimes they're all critical. 
but uh, let's check it out. What critical means, I hope you remember, is it means in that row, their vote actually was necessary to make it to the quota. So here, it adds up to 27. And I asked myself, for the A, do we really need that A to make it up to 27? A had 12, so if I took the A away, this would drop down by 12, which would go down to 15, and no longer meets the quota. That means the answer, yes, uh, we really did need the A in order to make it to 27 here. So in this case, A is critical. I believe the B and the C are not, though. If I, um, did we really need the B to make it to 27? Well, without the B, it's A plus C, which is 17, which does meet the, make the quota. And so in this line, B is not critical, and uh, neither is C. If I were to take the C away, it would add up to 22, which still makes it to the quota. So in this line, A is the only critical voter. The other two are not critical, all right? I hope everybody sees what I'm talking about. All right, what about you just got to uh, do that for each row. So between A and B, adds up to 22. If I omit the A, it drops down to 10, which is not meeting the quota. So the A really was necessary there. And same goes for the B, right? In this line here, if I were to take the B away, then it would drop down to 12, which does not meet the quota. So the B was also critical in that case. And then the next line between A and C, they only add up to 17. If I were to omit either one, it would not make it to the quota. So here the A is critical and also the C is critical. This is how we do it, all right? And this is pretty much the, the end of the work. Um, you summarize the answer by making fractions. So my final answer here is gonna be, you know, fractions for ABC. You could convert them to percentages if you want to. But the way you make the fraction is you just count up how many times that person was critical on the numerator. So for the, for the case of A, it would be three because A got three checks out of, and the denominator is the total number of checks that you see here, which is five, right? There are five total X's anywhere. So this is three out of five of them went for A, one out of five of them went for B, and one out of five of them went for C. This is how we do the bonds off. All right. This is all, this is sort of a refreshing your memory from last time. Are there any questions about that? I hope that this makes sense. Like I said, we're gonna do some more examples today. Um, I thought it might be interesting just to let you know, this exact example, if you flip back in your notes, you will see that we did the Shapley-Schubik for this. Remember the Bonsoff and the Shapley-Schubik are two different ways of trying to measure the power. And I said several times that you will get different answers. So I will just say sort of, Parenthetically here, the shapley schubik for this one, I don't want to go through it again, but I will, I'll tell you what, what we got when we did it. It said A was four out of six, B was one out of six, and C was one out of six. Uh, so the answers are different. I just wanted to emphasize, you do get different answers between the Bonsoff and the shapley schubik It's because they are using different methods to measure the power, but they have similar conclusions. I mean, when I see this Bonsoff ABC here, what I, um, my takeaway is that the B and the C have the same amount of power and the A has more power. Now, according to the Bonsoff, the A has three times more power than each of the others. According to the shapley schubik it's, it's similar. The B and the C are equal, the A has more. Now, technically, the shapley schubik says the A has four times as much as the B or the C, which is, you know, numerically speaking different, but it's just uh, because of how exactly the power is computed. All right, any thoughts about that? Let's talk some more about the Bonsoff then. Um, I wanna say a little something, and then I got a one for you to try. Actually, I want you guys to try one first, and then I, I will say a little something. So how about you try the same thing? All right. The Bonsoff for this here weighted voting system. 10, 6, 4, and 3. All right, I'm going to try and see if I can keep these both on the screen at the same time. 10, 
is the quota. The votes are six, four, and three. All right. See if you can make it happen. You got to make your uh, your chart there. See which ones are critical. I'll give you a few moments, and then I'll walk around and see how you're doing. Everybody's looking good today. I'm going to do mine up here. So when you did these, I hope you decided that actually the first two rows are the only ones that matter in this case. You only need to consider the ones which actually make it to the quota, which in this case is only the ABC and the AB. And then who is critical between A, B, and C? So in the first one, A, B, C uh, adds up to 13. Um, in order to get to 10, you need the 6 and you also need the 4 because if you were to omit either of those, it would drop below 10. You don't need the C, which is 3, because then it goes down to exactly 10, which is still meeting the quota. So that means A and B are both critical here. And in the AB line, it only adds up to 10. If you were to omit either one, it would go below 10. So the A and the B are both critical there. And that's it. The C is never critical. All right. I think everybody pretty much got 
what I said as I was going around. So that means the, uh, my final answer would be A is two out of four. There are four total X's there, and A has two of them. The B is also two out of four, and the C is zero out of four. That's how we do it. I can actually convert these to percentages in my head. If you like percentages, it's like this, right? A and B are equally powerful, and C has no power in the system. C apparently is a dummy. All right? Any questions about that? I think everybody got that one. It seemed that way. All right, excellent. The Bonsoff, it's not so hard to do. You know, you gotta make a, a fairly big chart, but I think actually, I don't know, to me this is a little easier than the uh, shapley schubik because you, you make your big chart, but actually most of it doesn't end up being relevant anyway. Uh, because you don't have to consider all the rows in the chart. Um, I want to talk briefly about how to list all the combinations. And in particular, how many will, the, will there be? How many will there be? Well, for three voters, A, B, C, um, for three voters, there are, how many, I mean, we just did this twice. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight rows uh, when there are three voters. So for three voters, apparently there are eight combinations. Ah. Combinations. All right, uh, I would like to, think about, or can we decide sort of, where exactly does that eight come from? How is that related to the three? And then think about what if there were four or, or more? Uh, how many combinations would there be in that case? Uh, what if there's four? In practice, we're not really ever gonna do any more than four just because the chart gets super big uh, and uh, super annoying to go through the whole thing. But um, what if there's four? So A, B, C, and D. All right. And um, you know, there's always, the first combination is just you take all of them. Uh, but then you have to think about um, each combination. Here's how I would like to think about this. Each combo either includes or excludes the A, the B, the C, and the D, right? This is how you make a combination. Each of those combinations consists of deciding whether you're gonna include A or exclude A, and also whether you're gonna include B or exclude B, right? Like each row here, this is why I like to kind of line them up in this way. I don't know if you wrote them the way that I did, but you can tell each one of these, either it does or does not include A, and then each one of them either does or does not include B, and so on. Um, so I think of this in terms of like, sort of filling in the blanks here, where each spot either gets a, like the first spot here is either gets an A or does not get an A, and the next spot either gets a B or does not get a B and so on. So this is A or blank, right? This one, this spot is B or blank, etc. Can anybody say how many total um, possible outcomes are there gonna be? If you, uh, you know, we talked something similar about the shapley schubik I'm gonna make choices and I have a certain number of options each time. Um, for how I decide this position, how many options are there? saw somebody show me the fingers. There are two choices for the first position, right? You can either use the A or not use the A. And then there are two choices for the next position. So um, can anyone say how many total options are there here? 16, yeah, how'd you get that? I just did, I just wrote out all the possible combinations. Oh, all right. Can anyone get 16 uh, in some other way? Yeah? Yeah, there are four positions here, and each time you have two choices. I either include it or exclude it. And over here, I have two options, either include or exclude the B. So we have four choices. 
two options each time. Right, so there's like two options here, two here, two here, two here. And remember, how, how do you get the total number of outcomes? You multiply those all together. This is just like we did before we got some factorials, but it's different. This is a different scenario, so we get a different uh, setup here. We have four choices, two options each time. So the total number of outcomes is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, right? Four of them. Uh, other fancier way to write this would be 2 to the power 4, right? That means 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, four times. And of course, this equals 16. So if you were to write them all down, hopefully you would be able to write out a total of 16 of them, all right? So the moral of the story here, for n voters, this was four. If I have four of them, you get two to the power four. For n voters, there will be two to the power n different combinations. All right, this is a pretty big number, but uh, it's actually less than n factorial. n factorial is you, add, you multiply up all the numbers from one up to n. This at least is only multiplying two every time, and those are smaller than if you were multiplying up all the numbers up to n. So there are two to the n different combinations. So that, let me just say this is less than the uh, shapley schubik which requires um, n factorial permutations is what they were called in that one, right? So it means when you're doing the Bonsoff, you make your big chart or whatever, that the Bonsoff chart is always going to be smaller than the shapley schubik chart. So in that sense, the Bonsoff is a little easier. And furthermore, on the Bonsoff, you get to disregard most of the chart, which is, makes it you know, even, even better, right? So um, two to the n different combinations. Let's just try and write them out for four different alternatives or four different voters. Let's try one. And this, you know, really, we're only going to do one like this ever, just because it is kind of big and nasty. Let's try one with four voters. How about, I got my example here. All right, let's try. And this is the last uh, example we're going to do. Eight is the quota, the weights are 5, 4, 3, and 1. All right. So I'm going to call these, you know, we have four voters this time. I'll call them A, B, C, D. And I need to write down all the combinations. There will be 16. Uh, so you could just try and sort of write them down at random and, and count them up and make sure you got them all. Although I think it's, um, it's not so hard to be sort of systematic about this. So I'm going to try to write these in a systematic way. I'm going to start by the combination that uses everybody. No exclusions, right? There's only one way to do that. You just take everybody. And next, I'm going to write down all the ones which exclude one person. Exclude one of them. So I could exclude the A. I would get B, C, D. I could exclude the B. I get A, C, D. I can exclude the C. I got A, B, C, uh, A, B, D, right? or I could exclude the D. I get A, B, C. All right, those are the ones which exclude one of them. All right, next I'm gonna do the ones which exclude two of them. And there's actually a lot of those, but those are the ones which, which only, they exclude two and they only use two, right? So this is exclude two of them. Um, I could, you exclude two, in this case, it means you, you use two and you leave two out. So there's a few that uh, use A, right? I could do AB, I could do AC, I could do AD. And then I could also use the B. I could do BC or BD. And finally, I could do CD. And those are all the ways that I could exclude two of them. All right? And, sorry, I got I to gotta scroll here. I could also exclude three of them, okay? That means you only use one, and those are easy to write down all the different ways you can only use one of them. That would be A, B, C, 
and D, right? Those are excluding three of them. And then finally, I could exclude all of them and use nobody. That's the nobody. Now, in practice, the nobody never ends up mattering in the Bonsoff, but just for the sake of making sure you got them all. And if you like, you could count these up. There should be 16, right? There's one here, and then four more is five, and then six, that's 11, and then four more is 15, and then this uh, nobody set makes for 16. I think I got them all. All right? Let's see if we can finish the example then. So what we need to do is add the values up to get the totals. So for the A, B, C, D, everybody uh, ready to add? For the A, B, C, D, you add them all up. This is 9, 12, 13, I believe, all right? Uh, B, C, D uh, omits the 5 there. It's going to be 8. That's 4 plus 3 plus 1. Uh, a, C, D is 5 plus 3 plus 1, which is 9. A, B, D is 5 plus 4 plus 1, which is 10. A, B, C is 5 plus 4 plus 3, which is 12. I hope you're comfortable adding them. You don't have to do it fast. You just have to do it right. Okay. Next is just A and B. That adds up to 9, which does still meet the quota. Uh, just A and C adds up to 8. A and D adds up to 6. B and C adds up to 7. I think actually all of these are going to be less than the quota from now on, right? The quota, remember, was 8. These ones which I'm writing here can never add up to 8. B and D is 5. C and D is 4. Just A by itself is 5. This is actually going to be 5, 4, 3, and 1, and 0. Anyway, none of those matter that are less than uh, Eight. So I can omit, oops, I meant to make this red. You can make it whatever color you want. All of these are irrelevant, right? The only ones that matter are the ones which make the quota, which in this example is eight. Any, any thoughts about that so far? And now we just got to go line by line here and decide who is critical. This is a little, uh, this part I think is a little harder than the shapley Schubik which is about the pivotal voters, uh, but it's not so hard. All right, in A, B, C, D, is A pivotal? If you take away 5, this is 13, but if you take away 5, it goes down to 8, which still meets the quota. So that means A is not critical. Did I just say pivotal? I should have said critical. A is not critical. And in fact, all the other ones here are also not critical. So there should be no X in this row. Because if you were to remove any one of those, it still would add up to 8 or more. All right. The next one only adds up to 8. If you remove any of these, then it's going to go below 8. So actually, all of those will be critical. That is B and C and D are all critical in that one. Because it only adds up to 8 in the first place. If you omitted any of them, it would not add up to the quota anymore. All right. In A, C, and D, it adds up to 9. Can anyone say who's critical in that row? A, C, D, and 9. Yeah? D? I think D is not critical because if you remove the D, I think you're, you're answering the opposite of what I asked. Um, who is critical here? D is not. The other two are. I think that's what she meant. The A and the C are critical. The D is not. So I say this and this, right? The D is not critical because if you were to remove the D, it'd go down to 8, which is still meeting the quota. But if you took away the A or the C, it would go below 8. All right. Uh, what about A, B, and D? Who's critical in here? Yeah, somebody said A and B. I agree. D is not critical here because it's 10, and if I take away D, which is only 1, it's still 9, which is still meeting the quota. A and B are necessary to get to the quota here. So it's like that. And then in A, B, C, adding up to 12. Can anybody say who is critical in there? A and C. A and C. Uh, if I look at A, I believe A is critical here because it adds up to 12. If I take away the A, it only adds up to 7, which is, uh, which is not enough. So A is critical here. What about B? B is 4. If I take the B away, it's only uh, 8, which is still meeting the quota. So the B is not critical. 
The C is three. If I take away three, it adds up to nine, which is still median and quarter. So uh, C also is not critical. It should be like this, only A. All right. This is difficult to say out loud. It's, this is more, more uh, appropriately done in the quiet of your own heart. You have to think all of these thoughts, which, which sound like gibberish when I say them out loud. I feel like I'm uh, not saying anything. OK, a little bit more. A and B add up to 9, right? I think in this case, they are both critical, because if I take away either one of them, it no longer adds up to uh, the quota. So here, A and B are both critical. And A and C adding up to 8, again, they are both critical. If it ever just barely makes it, like if you ever just tie the quota, everybody in there is going to be critical because if you omit any one of them, it will no longer make it to the quota. All right, that's about it. We just got to add everything, you know, count it all up. So the, um, my final answer, A, B, C, D, the denominator of these fractions is going to be the total number of X's, which you just have to count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 is the denominator. And how many checks does A have? You count down here, there are five X's on the A. So the A has five out of 12. The B has three out of 12. The C has three out of 12. And the D has one out of 12. So this means the B and the C are, have equal power. The A has more than those guys. And uh, sorry, I'm off the bottom. The D has less than those guys. That's how we do it. Any, uh, any thoughts about that? This is the Bonshoff. Just like the shapley schubik I would say it's not especially hard. You just got to do it for a few minutes and try not to mess it up. There are, there are a lot of opportunities to mess it up. All right. One last thing I want to say about the Bonshoff, and then we'll, we'll start talking about gerrymandering, which is totally different kind of thing. Um, and this is a simple thing. I could have said it before, but we just didn't get to it. But I will just say, just like in the uh, shapley schubik what about dictators and dummies? I will say, if uh, some voter is a dictator, let's say if X is a dictator, Remember, that means that their vote is the only one that matters. Nobody else's vote can add up to the quota. The only way to get to the quota is if you include X, right? And nobody else can ever make it to the quota. Um, what would you say about when, I come, when it comes to decide who is the critical voter? I think you should agree. If X is a dictator, they are always critical in any combination. You always are going to put an X, uh, like a little check mark by this, uh, the dictator. So if X is a dictator, they are always critical, right? A dictator always meets the quota just by themselves. And if you were to take them away, it would no longer meet the quota because that's what it means to be a dictator, right? So if X is a dictator, they are always critical. So, um, and I'll say, Uh, any dummy is never critical, right? A dummy means that their vote never matters. And so if you ask yourself, what if I exclude this dummy? Am I still meeting the quota? The answer is always going to be um, their vote doesn't matter, so they're not critical, right? A dummy is never critical. A dictator is always critical. That means when you count up like the, the check marks, the dummies get no checks, the dictator gets all the checks. All right, that's how this works. So what that means in terms of the, uh, the Bonsoff of a dictator is 100%, right? The dictator gets all the checks, the dummy gets none of the checks. The Bonsoff of a dictator is 100%, the dummy is 0%, all right? This you could use as sort of a shortcut. If I ask you to find the bonds off of some, some big system with many voters, if you notice there's a dictator, then you don't even have to make the whole chart. You can just say, if 
there's a dictator, that one has Bonsop 100%, and everybody else has Bonsop 0%. All right? This usually doesn't happen. You know, usually there isn't a dictator, but sometimes there is. All right? And that is going to do it for what I want to say about the Bonsop and actually all of uh, our discussion of weighted voting. This is the end. Any, any uh, remaining questions about weighted voting? I hope that's interesting to you. I think it's an interesting example uh, where the, um, the numbers that describe these systems don't always tell the whole story, right? That's, I will just remind you, I keep on saying that, but what's interesting to me about this is say, look at these numbers. It seems like A has the most power, then B, then C, then D. But actually, by doing the Bonsoff, we ended up showing that B and C have the same amount of power in this system, all right? Those numbers can mislead you, and you have to sort of dig a little deeper to figure out what's really going on. That's what's interesting about this to me. All right? All right, let's talk about gerrymandering then. This is totally different, much more uh, geometric. I, I would say really nothing that we've done so far has been geometric at all. Um, this is something that's a big deal in current politics. There was actually just um, recently some, uh, some big court decisions uh, concerning gerrymandering. So this is a big sort of big hot deal in uh, US politics today. And um, it's another kind of a systemic issue. That is, it's, um, it's an issue which uh, causes problems in American politics, mostly because of our choice of the setup of the voting that we use. Like um, when we talked about the, the ranked voting system, a lot of political issues come from the fact that we choose to use the plurality system in our elections. Um, gerrymandering is kind of the same way. Uh, the issues that we as a, as a society have with gerrymandering are because of the way the system is designed. Um, although in the case of gerrymandering, there are not a lot of easy answers to how can we change the system to make things work better. Um, anyway, it's about drawing boundary lines on voting districts. And I have a handout here. Actually, I don't know if we're going to get to the handout just yet. It's about drawing boundary lines in voting districts. All right. And this sounds like a totally obscure thing. And you could be forgiven for thinking that this is not really very interesting at all. It turns out it is extremely interesting and extremely uh, um, important in the way our politics works. So I will just, um, I have a detailed handout about this, but I think for now, I'll just draw my own picture. Here's a picture of the state of Connecticut. And the state of Connecticut is divided into, so gerrymandering is about drawing boundary lines in voting districts. What we are gonna talk about, um, and what, like when you, when you hear people upset about gerrymandering in American politics, Mostly what they're upset about is the U.S. House of Representatives. The U.S., uh, the Congress, right? You know, every state gets two senators, regardless of how big the state is. Um, every state gets two senators. But the amount of Congress people you get in the, in the uh, U.S. House is, is done by, po um, by population. And so California gets like over 50 representatives. The state of Connecticut, which has a much smaller population, um, has, anybody happen to know how many representatives Connecticut has? You experts. Uh, it is five, five house representatives. All right. Um, and in order to elect those representatives, they are elected in voting districts. And if I were to roughly draw them in this picture, they look sort of like this. This is a very rough drawing. They look kind of like that. This, my handout has the real picture, but just because we only have a few minutes. 
Um, and they're numbered. This is district one, two, three, four, and five. All right. And we are in district four. Fairfield is like around here somewhere. I'll put the star as if that's the most important place in the world. Fairfield, Connecticut is in district four. We are in number four. Our representative, anybody know? I know you guys probably are not from the town of Fairfield, but, uh, well, neither am I really. I'll, I, li I do live in the town of Fairfield. Uh, anyway, it's uh, Jim Himes. Remember that guy? I don't know. Jim Himes, I don't know much about him. He's a Democrat. Actually, I follow him on Twitter. I know he makes his own maple syrup. That's something I know about Jim Himes. I'm interested in this because I too make my own maple syrup. I have a big maple tree in my backyard. If you went to my house right now, you would see a big uh, Home Depot bucket sitting by the tree with uh, little, little tubes dripping into it. Yeah. Anyway, Jim Himes is our representative. He's a Democrat. Check it out. Um, when it comes to uh, the population of Connecticut, Connecticut population is registered in the in the uh, political parties <coughs> like so. If you just look at Democrats versus Republicans in the state of Connecticut, ignoring the uh, sort of independent registered voters, um, it's this. It's about 65% <coughs> Democrat and about 35% Republican. All right. Now, given that we in the state of Connecticut get five representatives, those representatives are going to be picked from the, uh, the two political parties, right? So we have five representatives. And in the state of Connecticut, about 65% are Democrats, 35% are Republicans. We have five total representatives. We would expect a uh, breakdown of our five representatives. Um, well, it could be maybe three Democrat, two Republican, right? This, because out of five, if you had three out of five, that would be 60%. Uh, this is like a 60, 40, all right? Or maybe, you know, because it does, the numbers don't work out exactly, but maybe it would go this way, which would be an 80, 20. This would seem, I suppose, a little unfair if you gave us four Democrats because uh, that would be 80% of the representatives, but uh, only 65% of the uh, state population is Democrats. But if you went to three and two, that would be 60-40, which is actually a little bit, uh, a little bit favorable to the Republicans. Although you might say that's, I mean, that's as close as you can get, right? You have to break it down some way. Anybody happen to know how, it, how in in reality, what the breakdown is? In the state of Connecticut, our true breakdown. We have. Five Democrat, zero Republican. That's, that's the, the scenario that we have in the state of Connecticut. Five Democrats, zero Republicans. That is representation, represent, representation of 100% Democrat, 0% Republican, while the population is, um, you know, uh, 65, 35, which is certainly mostly Democrat, but not all Democrat, right? 65% Democrat, 35% Republican, all right? The issue of gerrymandering is how can this be? Um, isn't that unfair somehow? I mean, we have some vague Democratic notion. Um, there's a concept called proportional representation. It means if there's a certain proportion of the population who feels a certain way, they should be represented in that same proportion. So if we have 35% Republicans, we want the, rep the representation to be about 35%. Uh, now we can't, because we only have five representatives, it can't be exactly 35, but you know, we get as close as we can, right? Not zero, zero seems totally out of whack. Um, anyone happen to know, why is it that we have five and zero rather than 
three and two, or four and one? Why is it five and zero? Uh, the answer is kind of gerrymandering, or at least it has to do with the way the lines are drawn, all right? It turns out in this, uh, in this, this diagram here, this map, the reason Republicans have no representati representatives, I will say, we'll talk more about this next time, but this is because the Republicans are geographically dispersed. This is a fact about just like where people live in the state of Connecticut. Geographically dispersed. What I mean is like um, the population is 65-35, but it's not like those 35% all live in District 3. They don't. They live kind of everywhere, right? So all of these districts have some kind of split like 65-35. And what that means is the Democrats are going to win all of them not just some of them, all right? So it is a fact. If you want representation in the United States, this is just how the system works. You not only have to like exist in the state, but you actually have to all live together. This is a weird thing. I mean, I don't know why, uh, nobody ever decided to design the system this way, but it's true. If you don't live together, then you do not enjoy representation in its proper proportion, all right? And this is why drawing the lines is so important. If you put the lines around your own friends, then you're gonna get a lot of representation. All right, that's what we're gonna talk about. See you next time. <laughs>